I'm uh, the director of, as she said, um, the Center for CSTEPS, which is short, Center for Science, Technology, and Environment Policy. Um, that's been around for about 10 years, and it's about uh, 12 people, faculty and, and PhD and master's students. And we're really interested in two types of, you know, two buckets of, of research. One is, um, you know, the policy effects on science, and policy effects on, on science and, and, and innovation. And then uh, also uh, the inform you know, how research informs policy. Uh, both of those are important in the food security area. And uh, for example, um, we're interested in how policies on genetic resource, genetic resources and genomic data uh, affect the exchange and use of materials for science. Um, as, you, as you know, there's a lot of national and global policies that affect how these things uh, move around the world. Uh, you know that the mobilization of genetic diversity and agrobiodiversity is really important for, for um, uh, working through many of the problems with uh, climate change. And, um, and so uh, we're interested in how these policies affect the way in which scientists behave, right? What kinds of decisions do they make on the topics of research that they, that they choose? What kinds of, what kinds of uh, uh, decisions do they make about their collaborators and who they're collaborating and where they're collaborating? Um, and then also, uh, the outcomes of that. So really trying to understand how regulation on the inputs to science affect the outcomes of science and innovation. And it's uh, dramatic, actually. Uh, these things have big downstream effects that I think need to be understood through this sort of broader food systems uh, approach. The other thing that I'm interested in is uh, sort of on the other side is um, this enormous new um, opportunity in you know, big data, sort of NSF calls it harnessing big data, and, and the opportunities both in science, in genomic science, um, but also in policy. Um, on the other hand, we've got major global issues on digital divide. And these, the, these issues are <laughs> really like, you can't just put data out there. You can't just give people computers. That doesn't create access to that data. People aren't able to use it. And so there's huge opportunity to connect the research policy interface with better data analytics in lower and middle income countries, better connecting data and people and capacities to use that will help innovative policies at a local level we'll do some of the things that you were talking about but focusing on this at a policy level is critical so that's uh, a couple of things that we're doing so my name is rimjim and talk about uh, vision the vision of my parents so rimjim means the music of the rain as it falls on the ground so i work on water and food issues, so that's vision for you. Um, so I work on smallholder agriculture. As we all know, a smallholder agriculture produces about 80% of the food in regions like uh, Sub-Saharan Africa and Asia, and yet they also constitute majority of the poor and the malnourished population. And so if we are really serious about making impact on uh, food security, we need to seriously impact smallholder agriculture. And this requires uh, very creative approaches and partners. And we have engaged a lot with community-based NGOs, but I'd like to make a case also for involving private sector. This is the direction we are taking. And this involves all the way from small and medium enterprises to multi large multinational corporations. So here I want to quickly talk about a partnership that we've had at ASU for several years now with Jain Irrigation Systems, which is a large multinational corporation from India. And I'm talking about them specifically because I was very intrigued by the way the founder put his business model to me. He said, 
Their business model centers around thinking about how we can generate prosperity from the smallest piece of land for the smallholders. And if you can get that puzzle right, think about that smallest piece of land, and you are able to do it for millions of the smallholders that we have, then prosperity would follow for all the businesses and the economy. And if you notice what is innovative about this approach is it turns this idea of trickle down on its head because you're starting from the smallest and thinking about how taking care of them would generate prosperity for everyone. And I thought that was interesting. And so we've worked a lot with them in understanding their business model, which focuses on a farmer centric approach. So you think about the smallholder and think about all the needs that they have within that system. And this then brings in thinking about where can the large multinational corporation help and where can you have small and medium enterprises filling in. So you need, if you think about the farmer, he needs not only the irrigation, but he needs better seeds, he needs credit, he or she needs credit and um, then agronomic support and finally marketing. So they encountered a number of cases where you set up a drip irrigation system, everyone starts producing fruits and vegetables, everyone brings them to the market and the market crashes. So we have to think about it in this uh, system-wide framework and we have been working with them. They approached us because they were interested in scaling beyond India and Asia where they were working into Sub-Saharan Africa. So one of the first things we did with them is we need to focus on creating that entrepreneurship ecosystem, focusing specifically on youth. So with ASU and uh, Jain Irrigation System, we've conducted a number of workshops focused on entrepreneurship, youth entrepreneurship, and mentoring support for youth in communities to start entrepreneurial ventures. <laughs> and then uh, uh, backing off of what Eric was talking about in terms of bringing better data, bringing satellite, uh, remote sensing and satellite data to think about how we make these investments in agriculture. Where should we invest in large water infrastructure projects? And finally, thinking about governance. And I'll stop there. Thank you. And I just wanted to say that innovation, she talked about innovation, and ASU is number one in, in innovation. So I work for the Morrison School of Agribusiness in the WP Carey School of Business. So all our solutions are entrepreneurship based. So my work is in South Asia where we look at this solving the problem of food security through the public private partnerships. So like we have the case of Nestle that works with uh, dairy farmers in India collecting supply chains and increasing the yield and yada yada increasing the income of the farmers and so prosperity through increased income which leads to increased consumption expenditures by the households. Uh, the second project we are looking at in Vietnam and other places, how climate change affects the food system, moving from lower delta where they grow the best rice, they move from there, do the shrimp farming on one side and then rice farming on the uplands. Same project in Cambodia, which I'm helping with the International Rice Research Institute. Uh, we are also looking at cases uh, in Nepal where we have these value added kind of approach where you take the rice or you take the uh, lentils, ginger, tomatoes, or high value crops that can be, have value added and exported. Uh, case in point, in India, we are working with organic basmati rice where we have value added kind of things and that being exported uh, to the uh, European countries. Uh, finally, we have a project that I'm working on and looking at this, what we call a small farms, large field kind of cooperatives in eastern part of India where the rice farmers are getting together, pulling their land, mechanizing it, uh, reducing the cost of production. And in that case, they're harnessing higher incomes and yields, leading to higher uh, food security for these smallholder uh, farmers that we, Rimjim was talking about. So a lot of stuff going on at ASU and Ag Mar Morrison School of Agribusiness and our systems approach through sustainability, through business entrepreneurship, and trying to solve the problems that farmers are facing in developing countries. All right, thank you. I brought my notes, so I'm gonna try and stick to them. So um, I was asked to talk about how one pass can uh, have devastating impacts. So um, many of you are probably familiar with locust plagues. 
Um, the FAO estimated that the last desert locust plague alone caused about 2.5 billion uh, in crop losses and cost about 400 million uh, US dollars to control. But perhaps the long-term impacts on livelihoods are more dramatic. So children born um, during plague years and villages that are impacted by locusts are much less likely to ever start school. Um, so at the Global Locust Initiative, we have the mission um, to work in interdisciplinary, cross-sectoral, and transboundary uh, teams. Uh, locusts are a continental-level challenge. We need to work across all these areas to improve farmer livelihoods and environmental sustainability. Um, we have three major pillars. We facilitate uh, fundamental and applied research. Uh, we are creating and maintaining a global network, and we're working with local partners to find solutions to the global challenge of locust plagues. Uh, we currently have projects in West Africa. We're just starting a USAID project in Senegal. Um, hopefully we can find some connections there. Uh, we're also working in South America, Australia, and China. Um, and we have GLI members from uh, more than 16 countries at this point in time. Um, all right, I'm going to stop there. I just want to thank all four of those <clears throat> for the presentations and discussions. I think it's important to just step back and note, you know, from the early 90s, for about 15 years, this big effort to invest in science-based agricultural development in lower-income countries around the world basically fell off the map. And from a global investment perspective, you know, it used to be 17, 18, 20 percent of USAID's budget kind of in the late 80s. It had gone down by 2005 or 6 to like 2 or 3 percent. And that was consistent across eight agencies. Rob Bertram is here, probably knows the exact numbers. But it, it, like they're, they're heroes like him that stuck with it, right? But, um, but institutionally and from a budget and investment and prioritization perspective, it just was, it was effectively ignored for 15 years. And there's a whole lot of reasons for that. From 2008 onward, we've seen a resurgence of, of, uh, of investment, of programmatic activity, of the kinds of science-based projects that you all just described. And the one thing I just want to make sure everyone recognizes is that resurgence is delivering massive results. Like, I get so excited about the Alliance for, the, for a Green Revolution in Africa because when I look at the 15, the 11, 11 of the 15 countries I believe in that alliance have now hit the target of 6% agricultural GDP growth on an annualized basis. We used to, I mean, I remember when it was like 1% and they were setting the goal of 6% and saying, is this possible to achieve? And people were like, oh, that's not possible. You, you couldn't, you can't get there. Why set something so unrealistic? And it took time and effort and political will um, but they got there, and, and that's now the basis for even more transformation. And that then relates to reductions in hunger, reductions in stunting in particular that have been profound and consistent. And, uh, and so thank you for the project you just described. I hope you also see that those are all contributing to this big global movement. And there are some folks in the room, like Phil and others, who were part of making sure we had a bipartisan consensus in this country when people didn't think it was possible to pass the Global Food Security Act, which I'll remind you is still only the second largest piece of global development legislation passed by Congress since the Foreign Assistance Act of 1961. The first, the biggest one being PEPFAR, the, the global fight for AIDS under George W. Bush. So it's a pretty amazing legacy that you are all contributing to and just stay with it. <laughs>